From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on Tuesday, February 1st. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. Dead cat bounce, stocks coming off their best two days since 2020, ending a messy January on a more positive note, but they start February on less firm footing. Eyes on earnings, UPS surges as higher pricing helps deliver a profit beat. Alphabet and GM set to report after the bell, plus we'll break down NXP Semiconductor's results with the company's CEO, Kurt Sievers, this hour. And diplomatic flurry. Blinken talks to Lavrov. Johnson visits Zelensky. Putin meets with Orban as global leaders focus on the Ukraine crisis. We still await Russia's response to the security proposals from the U.S. and NATO. From New York, I'm Kaylee Lines with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. And Guy, forget about everything I just said. The breaking news at this hour. Tom <laughs> Brady has officially announced his retirement from the NFL. Can we just talk a little bit for a moment before we get to ISM about Kaylee Lines' feelings about Brady? <laughs> I think everyone knows them at this point. He is the GOAT guy. Yeah. The stats speak for themselves. I'm not going to argue with it. Is, it. is he my favorite person? No, but congratulations to him on an incredible 22 seasons. That's all I will say. OK, we'll park that one. We're going to come back to it, though. Let me assure you about that. Uh, let's talk about the data that is hitting the Bloomberg right now. Uh, ISM numbers dropping, plus jolts as well. Uh, the ISM, let's go through the details. Headline number, this is ISM manufacturing, 57.6. That's actually slightly ahead of expectations. It's a drop from 58.7. Prices paid ticks back up again really quite substantially. Remember, this got up into the 90s, then it faded quite significantly. Last number, 68. The expectation 67 but prices paid comes in at 76.1 uh, new orders 57.9 that's a slight fade from last time the expectation 58 57.9 is the number the employment index comes through at 54.5 jolts comes in jolts comes in yeah, ahead of expectations. Uh, we were expecting 10.3 million. We get 10.9. Uh, the prior number's also been revised higher, Kaylee. Some pretty solid numbers here. And if you're looking for an inflationary narrative to come out of this data, it is a tight labour market continuing with inflation maintaining uh, its presence in a, in a big way. The prices paid component of the ISM, certainly something to pay attention to. And certainly something that central bankers are going to be paying attention to as well. Let's get more on these numbers with uh, the ISM Business Survey Committee Chair, Tim Fiore. Tim, when we look at that prices paid index in particular, is there a sense among manufacturers that we are reaching peak price pressure or do they expect that to persist? Well, so we increased our growth in January compared to December. But I think what you really had going on is you had a whole bunch of new prices going into place in January. So these prices were essentially set back in the October, November timeframe. They were implemented in January. So I think that's why you're seeing that number step up. But I think you're going to see it kind of relax as we go into February, March. I'm not overly concerned about the pricing number. I think, you know, the interesting what thing, the story of the month. Oh, I'm sorry. Go sorry, ahead, Tim, carry on, carry on. Yeah, I think the story of the month is really uh, Omicron and the high excessive absenteeism that has also caused uh, a lot more early retirements than we've had in the last four or five months. And I think that's why you saw the production number not pop as much as we wanted to, and also the new order number not get above 60. But you know, overall, you look at what's happened here in January, and we have, we've had some pretty good performance uh, in spite of all the headwinds that we have. And I think we're in a pretty good position here for the rest of the quarter. What, what about further on from that? There is this concern growing, Tim, that we're going to see some sort of a growth shock potentially later on this year after we've seen the, the Fed tightening. Just in terms of the momentum that we have right now, how sustainable do you think it is? Well, I, th I think it's, uh, it's strong. If you look, the employment number gained again. That doesn't actually mean employment on the factory floor for the month of January, but that bodes really well for the future. Uh, you know, I think our supply delivery number most likely should have went way up in the month of January. I expect that it's probably going to go up in February as a, a carryover from the January absenteeism. I mean, we heard reports of 15, 20% absenteeism in January. That's incredible that we were able to really produce as much as we did produce given all the unplanned absenteeisms from Omicron. The, the good thing about it was that the people who were absent weren't out for long mm -hmm. compared to what we saw back in Delta and, and prior to that. So, you know, I think we're, we've, we're off to a good start here 
And we've, we've run excessively long period of time here, over 60. If you look back over the last 20 years, we have never run that long over 60, significantly longer. So I think we're now going to, you know, we're settling in, as I mentioned last month, you know, 57, 59 and a half. That's good performance uh, year over month over month expansion of the manufacturing economy at a 57 to 59 is really good. So, uh, you know, I think we've probably now dropped below that 60 number absent some massive shock that would impact the supply delivery number. But I think we're in a good position as we start the year. Tim, you talk about the Omicron variant and the impact it has on the employee picture and absenteeism. What about China in particular and the COVID zero policy and how that could impact supply chains for some of these companies? Well, that's uh, for sure concerning, but China's been running at a PMI of somewhere around 50 to 52 for the last year and a half. They've been very sluggish. I think, you know, the biggest concern here now for the U.S. is we're in that pre-Lunar New Year bulge that comes into the, into the ports in January. Lunar New Year started today. Uh, hoping that for the next three or four weeks, as we get the final boats coming in, that we'll be able to burn off some of that backlog. I'm not so sure anymore, you know, especially given the fact that we've got potential labor issues on the West Coast ports in the summertime. So, you know, we're still struggling here with port congestion. We did have some positive indicators on the transportation side in the month of January that it is a little bit better than December. I wouldn't call it a victory yet at this point, but both the transportation sector and the labor sector and the supply chain sector, we had indications that things were better than December. Just picking up on that and, and figuring out where companies are with their inventory, what are you seeing uh, if we are going to see a continued issue when it comes to the ports, when it comes to China, when it comes to shipping? What do inventories look like, Tim, in terms of the robustness of these businesses uh, to keep going through these difficult phases? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that remains to be seen, but I do expect the, the manufacturing inventory number to pop back up in February and March. I think we had some carryover effects here from uh, end of year December that uh, that kept the, the inventory number uh, low. I think we're going to get back up to the 55, 56 level. So, you know, you, you stay running at a 58 new order level. You get production above 60. Now that you got the labor reporting back to the workforce, you gain one or two points a month on employment. Supplier deliveries hang at 65 to 63. Uh, inventory gets to 54, 55, and you know, you're in that 59 range uh, for the foreseeable future. Tim, it's always great to get instant analysis on this number. The market really has a great deal of hunger for that right now, trying to understand exactly what we're seeing on the screens in front of us as we try and figure out where the Fed is going to go next. Tim Fiore, ISM Business Survey Committee Chair. Sir, thank you very much. What are we going to do next? Our question of the day, uh, the first day of February. Have we seen over the last few days a dead cat bounce or is now the time to pounce? Let me assure you <laughs> that Kaylee Lines wrapping this question of the day is something that is going to happen on this program. <laughs> That's next. This is Bloomberg. Ten minutes past the app. Live from London, I'm Guy Johnson, Kelly Lines in New York. Alex Steele is off this week. This is Bloomberg Market. So our question of the day is this. Dead cat bounce or time to bounce? Now, I don't think I'm doing this justice. <laughs> Kelly Lines has a reputation in the office for her rappings. How would you say it? How would you Just a little, a say little that quicker, one? you know, with a little more pizzazz. Dead cat bounce or time to pounce? You know, pounce is the <laughs> emphatic word there, guys. <laughs> That's what you've got to hit, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Ryan Bostick, co-host yeah. of Bloomberg Markets, uh, The Close, and Bloomberg Markets editor, Christine Aquino, joining us. I'm not going to get either of you two guys to try and kind of go one better. I'm sure Romain could, to be honest. No. <laughs> um, but, but nevertheless, let's talk about the, uh, the direction of travel here and where we are with this market. Romain, let me start with you. I look at the charts at the moment. I look at the post-Fed rally that we've seen in stocks. Yeah. And I wonder whether the pouncing, I hope I hit that properly, has already <laughs> happened. Normally it takes four yeah. months for these kind of, these kind of drops to unwind. Yeah. We're on track to get back to record highs during the month of February. Are we moving a little too quickly back on the upside? I, I think so, because you have to ask yourself what sort of facilitated the drawdown to begin with. And the reality is we really haven't 
gotten, I guess, to the main event here, which is actually the tightening cycle for it to begin. Now, maybe that becomes sort of a sell the news types of, type of event. But remember, we're still a month, more than a month away uh, from when we finally do get uh, some sort of decision out of the Fed and we get a little bit more clarity about what they do. So I think to a certain extent, the sell off that we had may not have actually been the entirety of what we're going to get. It's just a matter here right now, guys, of the timing uh, and the pace uh, of how the market shifts. Yeah, Christine, I guess it's hard for all of us to believe we aren't in March already because January felt so long. What's going to be the catalyst between now and then in that, as Romaine says, in theory, the, the catalyst event has already been priced in by this market? Well, Kaylee, I think it's going to be all about the divergences and particularly how other markets and other central banks diverge from the main event, as Romain said, which is the Federal Reserve rate hike that we're all expecting in March. And so, you know, you really have this feeling this week of the baton shifting from the U.S. to Europe, because as you know, we have these two big uh, central bank events going on this week, uh, likely the, the BOE and, and the um, ECB. And it's really kind of hitting uh, markets over here in in such a way very similar to what we saw in the repricing in the U.S. when it came to the Fed heading into um, February and in, over in, in January. And so, yeah, I think for the moment, you know, uh, traders are kind of giving the Fed catalyst a bit of a rest and looking to other catalysts. Certainly in Europe, we have that in the form of BOE and ECB. And we'll see what happens after Super Thursday, how the dust falls. Super, is that what we're now Super calling it? Thursday. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready to pounce on that. Super <laughs> Thursday. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about, though, what the market is signaling about the Fed. I, so we had Harker on, Pat Harker on, a little bit earlier talking to the surveillance team. I, he's talking about March. He, he's kind of a little more reticent on the 50 idea, but certainly nailing down the idea that we are going to see some sort of a hike maybe in March, 25 basis points. What is the market, though, sig post, the, post the last Fed meeting, what is the market signaling about whether or not it believes that the Fed is going to do all that is expected of it? Because that comes back to this question of what you do with equities. Do you believe the Fed is going to go five times, seven times, depending on your, uh, on your kind of call on this? If you don't believe that, equities look significantly more attractive, potentially, assuming that we don't get a growth slowdown. Yeah, absolutely, Guy. I mean, in terms of kind of what we're seeing, whether the markets are believing the Fed, it really took them a while, actually, to get with the Fed in terms of what it was signaling, even dating back to December at the um, Jay Powell's press conference then, where he was saying three rate hikes back then. That seemed like a lifetime ago. But even then, when he explicitly um, signaled three rate hikes, it took the market a while to believe that. And we kind of see some, saw something similar from the markets this time around when five was on the table. And so we just got that pricing. Um, markets aren't necessarily gearing up to price for more, six or seven, as we've heard mm. from uh, several corners. And so I think it's really um, the bar is high now for the Fed to kind of surprise. On the hawkish side. Exactly, yeah. beyond what we're seeing here. Romain, we've talked a lot about the macro side of things. On yeah. the micro side, the actual yeah. fundamentals, which I know Taylor Riggs makes you talk yeah, about a lot on the She close. forces us to talk about that. Will yeah. a blowout from the likes of Alphabet or yeah. Meta make a difference to this I, market? The short answer is probably Probably not. They definitely don't. And while they're obviously high weighted companies, mm. they don't necessarily have the same pull that an Apple or a Netflix or a Tesla would have on the market here. Keep in mind, the fundamentals so far have actually been relatively good when you think about it. The concern is really the guidance and some of the drawdown. I will say this on the micro side. Yeah. Have you looked at the technicals? Because I think that'll to trust the technicals. That's my pun for you uh, on the day here. Because when you look at some of the key moving averages, you look at the RSIs on some of the major indices, they all seem to suggest that maybe we have come a little bit too far down, too fast, but you're not necessarily seeing it being pushed up quite as fast as we came back down. All right, Guy, you heard it here first. Forget the pounce, forget the bounce. Trust the technicals is the message from Bloomberg's <laughs> Romaine Bostic. And Christina Kino, thank you so much for joining us as well. That one was me. I actually did come up with it, Romaine. I know it was great. Thank you very much. All right, coming up, an upbeat forecast from one of the biggest suppliers of ships to the auto industry. We'll talk with the CEO of NXP Semiconductors, Kurt Sievers, next. This is Bloomberg. Live from London, I'm Guy Johnson. Kaylee Lines is over in New York, and this is Bloomberg Markets. Let's talk about uh, what is happening in the semiconductor sector. The also industry, as we all know, still desperate 
for all the chips it can lay its hands on. That means that we are seeing significantly rising sales uh, numbers for NXP Semi, the second largest supplier of chips to car makers globally. The company came out with a better than expected revenue forecast today. It is growing at a blistering rate. That top line number is certainly above what we're seeing elsewhere, even in the semiconductor sector. NXP's CEO is Kurt Sievers. It's great to have him on the program again. Kurt, welcome back. Thank you very much indeed for your time. These are blistering numbers. These are super strong numbers. How sustainable are these figures? Yeah, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Guy, for, for having me again today. Uh, we absolutely believe they are sustainable. Uh, and, and maybe just to put it a little bit in context, we had grown last year 28% year over year, and that is 25% over the pre-pandemic year 2019. So just to put it in perspective, half of our business is in automotive, and the automotive part of our business actually did grow by 44% last year, compared to a SAR growth of only a 25 or 3%, I believe, last year. Now, looking at the guidance, um, we just guided this morning uh, to have another year-on-year -year growth of 21% in the first quarter of, uh, of this calendar year. Uh, and I also made kind of a soft forecast for the year to be above our long-term growth plan, which is 8 to 12% over the next three years. So I did say we will be above 12% for the total company for the entire calendar year okay. 22. Now, I do think it is sustainable because our, the largest part of NXP is exposed to the automotive and to the industrial markets. Those are very lo longevity markets, uh, very sticky design wins, very, very, very strong content growth. If you think about electric vehicles, if you think about smart manufacturing in the industrial space, and our design win uh, inventory is so full that I'm, I'm very, very confident about that growth. Well, speaking of the automotive space in particular, Kurt, I was speaking with the chairman of Renault last week. We've heard from a number of auto executives that they think that the supply crunch on the on the semi side, on the chip side, is going to ease in the second half of this year. Are they being too optimistic? Uh, we actually believe that um, there might be areas where it's indeed a bit easing in the second half of the year. A bit easing means that maybe we come a little bit closer to, um, to a demand supply balance. Uh, but over and above, I do not think that at the end of this year, we will be exiting and will be in balance between demand and supply. And mind you, all of this is still in a situation where um, especially the auto OEMs and their suppliers, the tier one suppliers, would love to build up strategic inventory going forward. Nobody, I think, is going to be in any position this year to do this. We see inventory still being super lean across the entire extended supply chain. So I, I really don't see how, how we will come into balance uh, through this year. Kurt, in the past, this has been an incredibly cyclical industry. We're seeing huge investments at the moment being made by you, your rivals across the industry. You talk about the industry not getting into balance for really quite some time. Is this cycle going to be different? Are we going to see at some point going from sort of the famine to feast in terms of the availability of, of semiconductors on the market? Or, and I hate to use this phrase, is this, is this, is this cycle going to be different? Is this time going to be different? Well, I, I don't know if it is going to be different for the en entirety of the semiconductor industry. I think it is different when it comes to the markets which NXP is, 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 is almost uniquely exposed to, which is the industrial and automotive market. So think about three quarters of the company is in industrial and automotive. And here I do believe it is different for two reasons. One, the kind of applications which are coming up here are just showing significant sustainable new demand, which is not about shortwave mobile or computing demands but it's much more about stable demands in, in, in strong industries like automotive and industrial. China yep. is a very, you... a very large market for you, Kurt, and I'm wondering how you, you're seeing the demand picture there in particular, given some of the more idiosyncratic factors happening in that market in particular. Excuse me, Kaylee, I didn't understand. Which market are you referring to? China, which represents the bulk of your revenue. Well, China represents about half of our ship to revenue, um, but that doesn't mean all of that product remains in China. In many cases, we actually ship to China 
it's being built into a half finished or fully finished product, which is then re-exported uh, back to Europe or, or the US. Uh, we currently don't see any slowdown in the demand from China. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about production and what's happening with the increasing desire on a nation by nation basis to be able to have some degree of production on short. Kurt, we have the, uh, the CHIPS Act uh, going through Congress at the moment. We'll wait and see exactly on the timing surrounding that. But nevertheless, you are a company that, that outsources a, a decent chunk of your production. What do you make of the CHIPS Act? What do you think it's going to achieve? And will it change your thinking in terms of how you think about production and where you manufacture? Well, first of all, we, we greatly appreciate the CHIPS Act. I think it's a, it's a super important um, element of the policy in the US to strengthen the, 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 the chip industry in the US because there will be ever more demand and ever more dependence on semiconductors going forward. Uh, at the same time, what we are seeing is that where the semiconductor industry used to be almost a perfectly globalized industry, there is now more a move again, and I, I don't know where this is exactly going to land going forward, more a move again to be more regionalized. Because the same thing the U.S. is trying to do is happening in Europe. They, they, I think it's going to be next week. They're going to announce what they also call a CHIPS Act, which is the target to, I think, quadruple the amount of semiconductors being manufactured in Europe um, to a 20% world market share. So this is happening in the US and it is happening in Europe. And I think genuinely this is a good move. And given the fact that NXP is a very global company, we definitely support and appreciate that. Let's not forget we have actually have three manufacturing, large manufacturing facilities in the US. So we are in deep dialogue here to try and influence and benefit uh, the CHIPS Act for the U.S. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Kurt Sievers, NXP Semiconductors President and CEO. Appreciate your time and congratulations on the quarter. Now coming up, Bloomberg talked interest rates and, of course, inflation in an exclusive interview with Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker. He doesn't think 50 basis points in March is the move. We'll ask that question to Lisa Erickson, U.S. Bank Senior Vice President, about her expectations of Fed policy, how quickly they need to go. That conversation is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, along with Guy Johnson in London. This is Bloomberg Markets. Well, we're an hour into U.S. trading. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking the moves. And Abigail, it's not the best start to a new month I've ever seen. It certainly is not, and never a dull day. More volatility here for the first day of February. This is the uh, all-day, the all-session uh, chart of the NASDAQ 100 futures. So you can see in the overnight, very, very small declines, but then coming into the open, small gains, and then... We have this big dip around the ISM print, uh, the NASDAQ 100 at one point close to down 1% after having its best two days uh, since 2020, I believe it is. So the volatility that we saw in January continuing, but well off of those lows. As for what's dragging on the day, let's take a look at the shares of AT&T down 4.8%. This on their spin out, spin off plan uh, to combine their Warner Media assets with Discovery, plus cutting the dividend. We have Salesforce.com down 1.8%. No particular reason, and that seems to be the case for Apple and Microsoft as well. Yields are a little bit higher, so that could, of course, be a pressure for big tech. That's been a dominant theme that as yields rise, it brings valuation to question. Two top stocks, however, having to do with earnings. Let's take a look at the shares of UPS up 12.4 percent. The best day uh, since April of, I believe, 2020. This after they put up a blowout quarter, beating top and bottom line estimates. Importantly, uh, the guidance is excellent. They expect to put up $102 billion in the current quarter and margins preserved, excuse me, for the year, margins preserved 13.7 uh, percent. That, of course, is very important, too. So that stock up in a big way. And Exxon 
T-Mobile really get it, seeing a nice pop, the best profit uh, going back to uh, 2014 as oil and natural gas rises. Uh, those shares really uh, having a nice day, the best day since November of 2020. As for earnings season overall, it's really pretty interesting. Lots of different trends coming out. One here, the buzzword to come out of this current earnings season, it is supply chain. Now, there are others, but supply chain has that top spot right now with 1,100 mentions on earnings calls, followed by margins, inflation, headwinds, not so great. I will say one encouraging note, though, Guy, COVID on bottom, uh, 176 yeah. mentions. But again, supply chain, 1,100 mentions. Big time concern there. I, I guess they are both connected as we watch the impact of Omicron, not only in the United States, but also elsewhere, particularly China, uh, relating back to that uh, supply chain story. Abigail, great work. Thank you very much indeed. Abigail Doolittle uh, talking us through the market action thus far and what we're seeing in terms uh, of the supply chain story. Abigail talking about that in detail. Uh, it is certainly a subject that everybody is tracking very carefully. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker talking about the impact of supply chain crunches in terms of the inflation narrative, the, the impact on rising prices and then by extension on interest rates. He spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Mike McKee. The question is how quickly, and this has always been the question, how quickly are the supply chain constraints going to leave us? And it looks right now like they're, not, they're going to take some time. So slowing down some demand is what monetary policy does. I think it's appropriate. I don't think we're behind the curve in that sense because we don't affect a big part of why there is inflation. That said, I do think we need to move now uh, to try to control inflation. That is something I firmly believe. Well, move now, but then move how often after that and how fast? Yeah. Uh, the, you know the questions yeah. out there, the 50 basis points in March, uh, the seven uh, rate increases proposed by yeah. Bank of America. Uh, where do you come down on that? So, let me, again, let me step back from it. So we're going to stop the tapering in March. I would be supportive of 25 basis point increase in March. Could we do 50? Yeah. Uh, should we? Well, I'm a little less uh, convinced of that right now. But we'll see how the data turn out in the next couple of weeks. And then when we're sufficiently away from zero, we can argue what above zero is, 125 basis points, 100 basis points. Then we start normalizing the balance sheet, start bringing the balance sheet down, which, of course, will also reduce accommodation. So it's really a, a two-step process here. Uh, yes, we want to increase the Fed funds rate, which is our primary tool of monetary policy. At the same time, we want to start removing accommodation by shrinking the balance sheet. Both things have to happen in tandem, in my mind. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker in an exclusive interview earlier on Bloomberg Television. Let's bring in Lisa Erickson, Senior Vice President and co-head of the Public Markets Group at U.S. Bank, into this conversation. She's joining us now from Minneapolis. Lisa, obviously there has been a repricing of Federal Reserve expectations for 2022. That has weighed heavily on this equity market. And yet you say you have a glass half full view on equities right now. Why? Well, to your point, there are some overheads on the mar overhangs on the market, but we really are still cautiously optimistic on the U.S. stock market. And really, the reason is fundamental. So if you go back to a broad array of macroeconomic indicators, what we see is they continue to remain in solid growth mode with uh, uh, continued increases in what we see as far as the data. And then if you look bottom up at what company uh, earnings are reporting, we've actually had a very nice fourth quarter. And so we've continued to get a good number of beats, both by percent as well as magnitude. And so that gives us uh, continued confidence that those underpinnings for stock market prices are still remaining intact. Lisa, what kind of rate of return do you think I should be expecting this year? What will I have to invest in to get it more specifically? Well, when we look at the overall landscape, again, we see good operational results continuing both on the big picture macro basis as well as the micro basis. But that being said, if you just look at the past three years, we really had three years of very elevated stock market returns. So going into this year, we continue to expect uh, an up year overall for the market, uh, but we would uh, caution clients to realize that the level of gains may not be the same as what we've really experienced in the recent past. Obviously, a lot of the gains in the recent past have been concentrated in the growth stocks, Lisa. Is there anywhere within growth you'd be comfortable holding on to right now? 
Well, we continue to actually see a broad variety of growth as attractive at this current moment. We see both some of those secular growth names, even though more recently they've cut off, come off some of their valuation highs as attractive, simply because they continue to have those long-term tailwinds behind them in terms of changes in business spending, changes in consumer spending. But on the other hand, as we continue to reopen and the uh, recovery continues to become elongated as the economy opens in batches, we still see opportunity for cyclical growth as well. Lisa, there are some in the market that are growing concerned that we are going to see a growth shock, that the Fed is going to make a policy mistake, that it's going to over tighten, that the economy is going to slow and cl slow quite significantly. Maybe not this year, maybe at the back end of this year, maybe in 2023. The market is a discounting mechanism. When do you think we should start thinking about that as a concept and how would you price it in? Well, to your point, we certainly have an environment that's going to be tougher overall this year uh, for stocks than it was in the last year, simply because of what's going on in policy. And key among those, to your point, really is monetary policy. Whereas uh, we all know the Fed is really moving from one of accommodation to more normalization. And as that happens, that is going to be somewhat of a headwind for stocks, leading to our more modest positive outlook for the U.S. equity market. And so that is something we'll want to continue to monitor. The Fed is definitely uh, walking a tightrope here in terms of continuing to monitor its pa the pace of inflation and how it should respond to that. And yet, to your point, maybe not putting on the brakes too quickly in order to potentially bring down growth. In an environment where there is that growth concern out there, does cash have any role to play in a portfolio? Generally, we advocate really being fully invested in assets like stocks or bonds that will really provide return over the long run. It's very difficult to be completely out of the pool or in, a, in the pool uh, at any one point in time. When uh, assets rise, they can do so very rapidly and very quickly, and it's hard to catch that rebound. So we really advocate continuing to stay invested in your major risk on assets such as stocks and bonds and real assets. Were you surprised by the price action in January, Lisa? Well, certainly we've been expecting some volatility throughout, and uh, it really is on the back of, again, shifts in really what the monetary environment is. Again, that creates a, you know, really a more difficult air, uh, type of environment for stocks to outperform. And we also knew coming into this year that given the very strong corporate performance in 2021, that there would be tougher year over year comparisons for, for companies. So add those two things together. And again, we expected more volatility as investors navigated the developing data. But again, overall, we're still glass half full on the U.S. stock market. Lisa, and on that note, we will leave it. Great to get your views. Thank you very much indeed for sharing your time. Lisa Erickson of US Bank. Thank you very much indeed. Up next, uh, we're going to come back to Kaylee's uh, views on Brady. <laughs> I, I don't think we've explored this enough yet. He's retiring. I, you, can, you can hear the chuckle, the laughter, the happiness in Kaylee Lyons, his voice. We'll talk more about this in a moment. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Ritika Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Tune in to Bloomberg's monthly series, Chief Future Officer. The latest episode featuring Macy's CFO, Adrian Mitchell, is now on Bloomberg.com and on YouTube. This is Bloomberg. And let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Ritika Gupta. There's a flurry of diplomatic activity today as Western countries to try to keep Russia from invading Ukraine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will speak by phone with his Russian counterpart. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte will be in Kiev to meet with Ukraine's president. Meanwhile, both the U.S. and the U.K. are finalizing a package of potential Russian sanctions. Kim Jong-un has now blasted his way onto President Biden's foreign policy agenda. In January, North Korea's leader conducted more missile tests than he did in all of last year. That's seen as a signal that Kim is preparing to fire a long-range missile that can reach across the U.S. North Korea wants the U.S. to lift sanctions, whilst the U.S. wants an end to North Korea's nuclear program. 
And in pro football, it is now official. Tom Brady is indeed retiring. The Tampa Bay quarterback is stepping away from the game after 22 seasons in the NFL. Brady won seven Super Bowls, six of them with the New England Patriots. Five times he was named the game's most valuable player. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg Gailey, uh, Kaylee Guy. <laughs> Seven Super Bowls. Yeah. I've got three MVPs, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, Fifteen Pro Bowls. I, this guy was an amazing athlete, probably one of America's greatest ever athletes. And Kaylee has an issue because he didn't like getting knocked over. One could argue that he molded the NFL rules so that he gets hit as little as possible. So maybe that makes it a little bit easier to be the GOAT. That said, the statistics speak for themselves. We are Bloomberg. We follow the data. And the data does tell us he has the most ever on-record career touchdown passes, passing yards, completions of any player in history. Yep. I will give him that. Still, though, not going to change my opinion on... I, I wish, I I wish we could just replay what you said during the break because <laughs> that was slightly less charitable. But we won't do that. I'm trying to be polite, Guy. He has had an amazing career. Truly, truly. Do I still prefer Peyton Manning over Tom Brady any day? Yes, yes, I do. And we will leave it at that. Okay. Should we get back to the markets now? I feel like I should probably stop. Do we have to? Opining. I wish we didn't, but we are Bloomberg Guy. We follow the data and we talk about the markets. So let's do that right now. One stock in particular we are following today, UPS shares jumping this morning after the company issued forecasts that beat Wall Street's estimates. The company has prioritized boosting profit margin over volume under the new CEO. For a closer look, we welcome back Bloomberg's Thomas Black, who is joining us now. Thomas, looking at the heads from the conference call as well, they talked about how they expect pricing to remain firm in 2022. What does this tell us about their ability to exercise this pricing power and the trajectory for demand? There's still a lot of package demand, and they have leverage on pricing through uh, this year for sure. And not only that, they, they are shifting their mix of sales towards small business packages, which also pay more. So they're, they're not only getting the price increases, but there, there's some self-help in there as well. In terms of managing labor, they are, they are being successful. It was interesting, FedEx uh, on its web page a little earlier on um, saying that Omicron has caused temporary labor shortages. Why is UPS able to manage these um, in a more formidable way? It doesn't seem to have been touched in the same way as the rest of the industry. That's correct. UPS is the gold standard for, for parcel industry wages. They pay the highest among all the companies. They have a mostly unionized workforce and pay great benefits. And even their temporary workers tend to be paid more. So they, they weren't short on workers uh, during the peak season, where, whereas FedEx was. And I think that limited uh, some of the, the volume that was there, but it, it didn't limit it for UPS. Obviously, when we're comparing UPS and FedEx as well, we have to talk about the Amazon uh, factor in this equation, Thomas. And I noticed that only 11.7% of total re revenue came from Amazon in 2021. That is down from 2020 levels. How significant is that? It's settling down a little bit toward the pre-pandemic range. Uh, I believe 2020 was an extraordinary year because a lot of people were locked down and they were ordering Amazon because they didn't want to go out and shop, that, that's, uh, that's subsided some. People are going back to stores. So I think that relationship is, is settling down and into more of a comfortable zone where Amazon is, is more in the range in which they were in pre-pandemic. How do they get hit by higher fuel costs? I, it, it's, it's a business that basically flies a lot of airplanes, drives a lot of trucks. I appreciate that some of those trucks are going towards uh, being driven by, by electric motors rather than imp internal combustion engines. But what is the, the other than labor, what other cost factors is this company going to have to deal with? And how can they hedge some of that? How much pricing power do they have right now to pass those extra costs on? As far as fuel goes, they passed that through almost automatically through fuel surcharges. So the customers end up paying for that. And that's standard throughout the industry. A lot of people think that trucking companies and railroads and the parcel carriers will get hit by fuel, but it, it's passed on almost automatically to, to customers through these fuel surcharges. 
And let's talk about the composition of those customers, Thomas. Is UPS really just waiting for a bigger rebound in the business segment here? I don't think so. I, a lot of there was a narrative around that, but you, they said on the conference call today that their split of sixty percent residential packages for percent business packages probably will maintain itself going forward. So I think they're in a new e-commerce yep. world. And the exciting thing and the reason that the stock is popping so much is that their margins are expanding mm -hmm. even with these increased residential deliveries, which tend to, to be less profitable than the business packages. But I guess with everybody returning so much stuff as well, that's an extra kicker on top of that. Um, as you say, the e-commerce business certainly taking off rapidly. You saw that around Christmas. You saw it into January. Um, Thomas, demand is still strong. Thomas Black, thank you very much indeed. Greatly appreciated. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. Airbus has dodged the threat of strikes in Germany. It reached a labor deal that would allow continued production of its best-selling A320 jetliner. The agreement rules out mandatory job cuts at German restructured parts plants until 2030. Home Depot has a goal that will be made more difficult by the tight labor market for retailers. The home improvement chain plans to hire 25% more workers for its critical spring season. That's a total of 100,000 employees. Home Depot says it will speed up the process so it can make an offer within a day of receiving an application. And Tesla is disabling a feature of its self-driving system that came under scrutiny from U.S. regulators. It allowed cars to slowly roll through intersections without coming to a complete halt. When no other cars or pedestrians were present, no accidents have been reported. Tesla will recall more than 53,000 vehicles. And that is your latest business flash, Guy. Ritika, thank you very much indeed. We're counting you down uh, to the close on the first day of February here in Europe, and it's a generally positive session. We're off our highs here in Europe. Uh, the basic resources sector, the miners are doing very well. The banks are having a really solid day. I'll show you UBS in just a moment. But the stock 600, 473, we're up by a percent, trading up around five points. One factor that's in the mix certainly is what is happening in the foreign exchange markets right now. The euro is catching a bid. So it's interesting. You come through month, month end, you see that demand for dollars. That's now fading out of the system. The euro is catching a bid. We're also repricing really quite significantly the ECB. We've gone from 10 to 25 basis points of hikes price this year. Now, I suspect the Lagarde's going to push back really strongly come Thursday on that idea. But that pricing is having an impact into the foreign exchange markets. So the rates market now leading the foreign exchange market. And the euro is gaining a little bit of traction on the back of that. Uh, 112.60 is where we're trading. We'll talk about that more in the next hour. We, today we've got French inflation data that kind of backed up the news we got yesterday in terms of the G German and Spanish inflation data. All of the data is coming off in terms of the inflation narrative, i.e. we're seeing a fade, but it's not fading as fast as anticipated. And that's the interesting story for the ECB to grapple with right now. The corporate story uh, dominated by a number of names here. It's UPS over in the United States. It's UBS over here in Europe. UBS uh, up by 7.37%. Uh, the Zurich-based bank having a really solid day today on the back of its numbers. Fixed income was very, very strong. I thought the equity business did really well as well. Uh, we heard from the CEO. Uh, Manus Cranny interviewed him. We'll hear from him in the next hour and get an update on what is happening here because the strategy update looked really good, Kaylee. So a really solid set of numbers coming out of the banking sector here in Europe. How useful is that? in terms of some of the other banks that we've still got to yet report. UBS up by 7.4%, Kelly. Well, since you mentioned a guy, I feel like I should check on UPS shares now, and they actually are up more than 14%, potentially on their way to the best day since November of 1999. Far and away, the best performer in the S&P 500 right now. Granted, that isn't all too difficult to do, considering it is mostly a down day for the broader equity market. It's really tech that is leading the losses today. The Nasdaq 100 off by about half of 1%. Not a great start to February after closing out January with its best two days going back to November of 2020. In the bond market,
market. We're hitting right around 180 on the 10 year yield up the better part of three basis points. And the dollar is weaker guy that raises the question. Is it so much euro strength or dollar weakness? Of course, we'll help answer that in the next hour guy. We certainly will. We've got a lineup of guests that are going to really tackle this issue around ECB pricing and the inflation data that we're seeing. Katharina Utomol, Allianz senior European economist, joining us next. Ian Steely's going to join us as well from JP Morgan. We'll talk about this next. This is Bloomberg.